So a lot happened in 2024 and a lot needs to happen in 2025. For those of you that haven't been around as long, in 2022, I left my day job to go full-time self-employed. And for two years after that, I did a really good job of running a business that could very efficiently turn money into more work for me. Uh, it did not turn my work into money. It basically just did the opposite. At the beginning of 2024, I pivoted to running a machine shop, running a job shop that has actually earned me money since then. Later in this video, we're gonna go through all of my numbers for 2024, how much I made on Zometry, how much I made outside Zometry, how much I made on YouTube, etc. So, my business goals for 2025. One, I want to double in revenue. Two, I want to do half as much work. And then three, I want at least half of my income to come from non zometry stuff. So, products, YouTube, etc. Now, interestingly, about six months ago, I recorded a similar video talking about my goals for the remainder of 2024 at that point. And the goal that I laid out was to diversify my income. I both accomplished that and also failed at the same time. I did not accomplish it in this business. My machine shop is still almost entirely running off of Zometry. However, the YouTube channel kind of grew on its own, giving me a measurable amount of income every month from that. And I took a part-time teaching position at a local community college. Audacity Micro, the machine shop, is still the vast majority of my income. And so this is what I'm going to focus on growing over the next year and, I don't know, forever after that, ideally. So getting back on track here, doubling the revenue with half the work. How do we do that in 2025? That is the question. There are a lot of missing pieces that I still need to figure out, but I have a game plan. I have a plan to figure out what those missing pieces are and how to fill them in. And a lot of this comes down to everybody's favorite P word, processes, and everybody's favorite A word, automation. If you look at my business right now, it looks like this. This web of nonsense is how my business runs. I'll let you pause this to look at my flow chart. I don't think I'm gonna go through this version of the business in super detail, but essentially the sales process drives the programming process, which drives the mill setting up process, which drives the making parts process, which makes parts that then get inspected and then shipped. There's a lot of like tangents and side effects, but essentially that's how any job shop works. But we can take this messy spider web and boil it down to 11 processes. I'm calling these the 11 golden processes. These processes are what drive the business. These are the core of what I do and how I make money. Those processes are in order, sales, quoting, purchasing, programming, prepping materials, setting tools, setting up the mill, setting up my fixtures, making the parts, inspecting the parts, and shipping the parts. We should probably add making coffee as the 12th or maybe the 0th process. But those 11 golden processes are what I need to really dial in in 2025. Now, there might be some old timers who would disagree with looking at a machine shop this way. But at least in my business, the way that it's run, the core, most critical, most important, most creative, most value add step is programming. Programming drives basically everything after the sales process. It determines what materials and tooling you need to order. It determines what tools you need to set on the machine. And it determines how you need to set up the machine. It determines what fixtures you need to use. It, you could even argue that it actually drives your quoting as well, because in your program is where you determine how much the job is actually gonna cost you in terms of material and tooling and machine time and human time. If we redraw the business process flowchart using only the 11 golden processes and center it around programming, it looks like this. This chunk in the middle here is specifically what I want to work on in 2025. I want to get that as automated as possible. When I say automated, I mean two things. One, I do literally mean a robot. This space right here has been earmarked for a robot since I first put this Tormach in here. I totally plan on getting the Tormach robot and using that to load fixtures in and out of the machine. But I also use that term to mean 
streamlining some manual processes so that they are so simple that the operator does not need to think about them. I should not have to figure out what tools I need to set for a given job or what stick out length those tools should be. That information should all be in front of me ready to go. I also shouldn't have to go figure out where to set the work coordinate systems or anything like that. I also shouldn't have to figure out how to inspect the part. That should be a problem that's solved before I get to the inspection. So I don't plan on having any sort of like robotic automation for inspection this year, but at very least I want the processes to be so simple that myself or anybody can do them without thinking. Let's get a little bit more specific. What do we need to do to actually get this stuff automated? Well, one, we need the robot. Now the robot's probably gonna be the last thing I throw in because it's going to be the simplest. All you have to do is throw money at that problem. We could get the robot here, you know, in a couple days and get it set up and running, you know, probably a couple days after that. But the robot needs to know what to do and we have to make sure the mill is set up for it. I'm gonna be fixture loading, not part loading. So I need fixtures for the mill. I need those standardized. I need the mill to be set up and you know, have standardized work coordinate systems and all of that stuff. I also need to work on my standardized tooling and work on systems for managing the non-standardized tooling. I'm also gonna to need to do something in the way of standardizing stock sizes and again, managing the non-standard stuff. And I'm gonna need some way of scheduling the robot and managing all of this information. And that is actually gonna be kind of the key and the driving force between all this automation that I'm doing is this master scheduling management program application thing. You could argue that basically I should just buy an off-the-shelf ERP and use that for everything. A, an off-the-shelf ERP like ProShop probably would do a lot or most of what I need. The problem with ERPs is, though it kind of feels like the robot where you can just throw money at the problem and have it solved, ERPs don't actually work like that. And to get them set up and running well, you need to do a whole lot of integration, both with like your business processes, but also if I want it to drive the mill and drive the robot, I'm still doing a bunch of custom software work. Essentially an ERP would give me just as much work, but I'm throwing a lot of money at it too. So it cost, uh, an ERP is out. The smart thing to do would be to go to a company like Lights Out Manufacturing that has a lot of experience with robots, it's got a lot of experience with scheduling jobs and stuff like that, but they cost money and I don't want to spend that money and I want to learn this stuff myself, I want to be able to develop it myself, I want to have full control to do weird stuff that's maybe not um, something that a smart machinist would do. So I have gone down the custom software route. My system is far from fully functional, but I'll show you what I have so far. So like I was talking about a minute ago, everything starts with programming. That is where the creative value added stuff happens. It's the stuff that sets me apart from other people. We start in Fusion. So my automation is going to start in Fusion. So let's say we have the part programmed. I have just this uh, set of soft jaws I'm gonna use as an example. So if we look inside this NC program, you can see under the post properties, I have a whole section labeled automation. I can do things like specify a fixture. I can write a uh, description of the offset. So I could be like top center. I can specify the number of parts that's required, the stock material, uh, let's just say they're brass. I can specify the shape of the stock and what offset I'm wanting to use. When I hit post, this is program 1111, okay, we'll post that. Um, if we look at the code, other than some debug information here, it's not really any different. The code is still just code, but you can see it does things like pick up the number of tools and the stock size. It's taking that information from the setup. But now if we come into VS code, we can run my custom little widget. And you can see here that we have a job queue. So let's say we wanna run our job 1111 first. I can move that up to the top and I can reorder the other jobs into, you know, whatever order I want to run them in. If I click on a job, it'll show me the information about the fixture and the stock. It'll show me the tools that I need. It gives me the quantity required and allows me to keep track of how many I've produced. Now, if I want to mark a job as finished, I can just do that and it will move it off into a different folder. 
there's still a lot of work to do. But even in its current form, if I take that little application, I can put it out on a computer next to my mill, it'll give the operator of the mill, me, all the information that I need to set up the machine. Or it will eventually. It's not quite there yet, but we're getting there. So for the next couple of months, I can just pretend to be the robot using all the information that the robot would get. I can build out those systems. I can test the systems. And then when we're ready to throw the robot in, we just put the robot next to the mill and the robot can access and process the exact same information and make its choices about which parts to pick up and put in the mill and stuff like that. The next step is to build a table out there that has a grid of a row of pallet fixtures and inside that program, it'll keep track of which fixture is in which grid space and it'll be able to tell the operator, hey, load this material into grid A, load this material into grid B, and you know, hey, take what's in grid A and stick it into the machine. So it'll essentially give me a to-do list of what materials and what fixtures I need to set up, and then it'll also give me a to-do list of what materials and which fixtures I need to load into the machine and when. That's not super necessary when it's just a person running the machine. However, that will be super necessary when it is time to implement the robot. Because then I can just go along, I can set up 25 different positions with the correct materials and the correct fixtures, and the robot will be able to just load them one after another when I'm sleeping or teaching school or whatever. But by me spending a couple months pretending to be the robot, we can work out all of the kinks in the process before we actually spend the money and commit to the robot itself. So now I think it is time that we go back a step and we talk about what happened in 2024. Started 2024 with just the Haas office mill. It's a good little machine, but its spindle is starting to die on me and I need to get that replaced and it just wasn't keeping up with the amount of work or the type of work that I was doing. So thanks to Tormach, I added the 1500MX. And yes, I am a Tormach ambassador. If you wanna see details of my contract with Tormach, I have a video where I go through that whole thing. I'll link it down below. I also replaced my crappy little Harbor Freight horizontal bandsaw with a bigger automated one, again, from Tormach. Though I did buy this one used. In 2024, we also finished off the sanding, grinding, air compressor room, which is a mess right now. But this has done a good job at keeping the mess in here and away from, you know, my higher dollar value machines. In general, has also just become neater and more organized. There are still messy portions of the shop that need to be tackled, but frankly, I have more space than I need. Most of my work happens right in here. And so all of this extra space over here just hasn't really been tended to because I hadn't, I haven't needed it. I'm kind of shoved in a corner right now, but I did also add an optical comparator to the shop, which has been critical for measuring some of the parts that I make. And most importantly, I added a water cooler to the shop, which is the dumbest little quality of life upgrade, but I drink so much more water because of it because I always have nice, crisp, clean, cold water. It sounds so dumb, but this was the best $30 I've ever spent in my shop. I added a Aroa pallet system to the Haas office mill with one coming soon to the Tormach. Let's get into specifics in a second here, but in terms of finances, I'm still here. I'm obviously still well fed. My family has been well fed. We have heat, we have power. And at the end of the day, it's kind of all you can ask for. In 2024, I took zero debt. I only paid down debt. Uh, I did not even use a credit card to finance any material purchases or anything like that. It was done entirely off of cash. I did not even pull any money out of savings or anything like that. It was funded entirely from cash from the business. No credit, no additional debt, nothing. All right, let's talk details. What does YouTube and Zometry pay? So here is what everybody has been dying to know. How much money do I make on Zometry and how much money do I make on YouTube? Here it is. This is my finances laid bare to you guys. In 2024 on Zometry, I had a gross revenue of about $75,000. In terms of content creation, I made just under $10,000. About 4,000 of that was specifically YouTube ad revenue. The remainder was video production work that I did for other companies. My non-Zometry job shop work was basically a rounding error of about $1,200. Of the 
approximately $85,000 that I had come in. I had to spend approximately $3,700 on materials, tooling, machines, etc. I took home a total of about $49,000. I would like to point out that this is not my total income as I also have the teaching income and a couple side sources of income. For example, my wife bakes and sells a shocking amount of cookies and we have a small Airbnb that, that has netted us a couple hundred dollars for the last few months. In terms of expenses, my largest expense was materials, which makes sense. My second biggest expense was capital expenditures. That includes the machine payments on the Haas, as well as investments into metrology and fixturing. Tooling came out at $5,000. Then it's just kind of odds and ends from there. Things like travel, sending parts out to finishing, software, etc. Now, one thing I would like to point out, there are a couple things missing from this chart because this is specifically addressing the amount of cash that is coming in and the amount of cash that is leaving. For example, I have equity in my Haas mill, even though I still am making payments on it. If I were to sell it right now, I would regain some percentage of the equity in that machine. Also, with the new Tormach, it's kind of hard to judge the equity. Uh, technically, I don't own that until the end of my contract with Tormach, but if you prorate it, I have a couple thousand dollars of ownership in that machine. This also does not include Amazon affiliate revenue. That is approximately $200 over the course of last year. And I make so little money from the Amazon affiliate program that they just pay me in gift cards. So it never actually hits my account. Overall, the business is running at approximately 57% profit. That is greatly boosted by the about $10,000 that I'm making from content creation, which doesn't really have much in terms of expenses except some software costs. If we isolate just Zometry in that $75,000 that came in, and we just pay attention to my material, tooling, and general shop expenses, I profited approximately 70% from Zometry. So for every $100 that I made on Zometry, I spent approximately $30 to make that money. Though with that math, I'm not including my machine payments or investment in fixturing. That's just work and cost of goods sold. Overall, I'm actually pretty happy with these numbers. The job shop is really, like that business is really just a year old, even though I've been self-employed for three years. The first two years I was doing something else. So Audacity Micro as a job shop is only a year old. And the fact that I made about $50,000 in my first year is actually shockingly good for a new business. Most shops do not show a profit in their first years. And the fact that I have been able to make a 57% profit with taking zero new debt, very happy with. Um, $50,000 is definitely tight for me and my family of five to live on. Even if you include our extra streams of income that weren't covered here, that still only pushes us up to fifty-five dollars or $60,000. And that's just not enough to live on right now. Um, we managed it. We survived. We're doing okay. But it was not comfortable in 2024. But going into 2025, if I am able to double our revenue, then we will be living very comfortably. Well, and I think with those numbers, that wraps up 2024. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.